It'll be fun. My name is Paul Barrett. Welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me today is, of course, Mr. Kyle Wilson, our co-host, and also hosting the uh, Diamond Circle podcast. So welcome in. Yeah, thanks for having me on today and happy to get into some of the topics and a lot going on in AVAX and when Web3 Gaming. So, Yeah, for sure. So Kyle, let's go into uh, GamesCon. Of course, a lot happening out there, and we'll we'll talk about you know the first Web three game that actually got uh, I guess listed in a way. And if you if you look at Gamescon and in general, just to get into this this ranking, I should not say ranking, just to get into these lists and actually being releasing out there in Gamescon for a Web three game to hit, this is pretty significant. I wanted to play the trailer real quick for Gamescon. Let's jump to the trailer real quick. Three huge game developers have gotten together to create the ultimate gaming experience. The top video game players in the world, are they any good in real life battle royale type situations? Anybody can play, you just gotta be brave enough to take a bullet, but there's a chance for fame. There's a chance for fortune. Godzilla! <laughs> Don't forget to, to smash that like and subscribe button uh, at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, I like it. Not bad. You know, Godzilla's... Uh, so here you got IGN actually covering this. Holy moly, we have a Web3 game on IGN right there. Godzilla, can you believe it? And, and also it's alternative, I guess, off the grid. Uh, but... When you look at that and you, you think about the release we're going to see within uh, the PS5 and the Xbox, I think I've got some coverage here on this, Kyle. Yeah, here you go, off the grid, right there. So PS5, Xbox, and PC, um, pretty big. What do you think uh, really, or do you think this is a huge, important leap forward for something like a Godzilla, which is kind of a Web3 game here? Yeah, I think this is big, you know, especially reaching consoles. It's a, a wider market, you know, aside from PC. So I think this is definitely a big win. And obviously with Neil Bokenkamp and uh, the movies he's created and kind of you can see a lot of his, uh, I guess, you know, I guess uh, a digital representation that you see in the movies, I guess, like the right. kind of lore is built into the game. You can kind of see that, how he's crafted that. Um, he's chief visionary officer of the game. So um, I, I think this is exciting. I think you know people that have watched his movies uh, are going to be pretty excited about this as well, uh, both young and older gamers alike. So, um, yeah, I think this is a win. Seeing it on IGM's big too, and um, I think this de definitely has some potential. We still need to see some uh, how the NFTs are going to actually work in the game, and to see it, you know players still react to it on YouTube and all the other social sure. uh, media outlets and things like that. So, uh, but overall, this is an in initial win. Yeah, do you think that this being kind of one of the first Web3 and integrated NFT uh, games out there, do you think there's a lot riding on this in terms of success versus failure? Or is it just, hey, any players that come to it, at least it's going to expose the, you know, the Web3 concept? Yeah, I think it will. I think this is still going to be a victory, even if there is like backlash or people saying, you know, negative things about the game, because you still off the heels of this, you still have other games that are going to be prominent and upfront, you know, in the in center in terms of uh, gaming, especially what Dr. Disrespect's doing. And you look at his friends in the streaming space, you know, Dr. Lupo, Tim the Tapman, they've all played his game as well, Dr. Yeah. Disrespect's game. And they all have almost, you know, millions of views on their content alone. So even if this game gets some backlash, I think this is still going to, um, you know, have a chain reaction of what gamers think in the long run in yeah. a positive way. Yeah, for sure. I was looking at Godzilla's process on bringing, you know, artifacts that kind of into the game, but the real-time scan of real battle gear. This is pretty cool in the way that they're actually bringing kind of this whole idea of reality into the game. When you look at that, and then you also look at uh, some of the clips I want to play, one is their their gun promo video. So let's, let's go to that so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. And this is one of theirs. It's an old Zero favorite, the CTAS Vetevit 19 Bulldog... Bull pup. I'm sorry, bull pup configuration. And it goes something like this. Fuck me. 
<laughs> a nice light trigger action and all round hard wearing build. All right, and then you go to their gun, their gun showcase. So this is just it goes back to your point of the guns in these movies have kind of transcended into these games. Let's take a look at that clip. Real, photorealistic, really. Uh, and then you, you take a look at that, and then we'll play a clip just uh, here from District 9, another, you know, Neil Bocamp film. But, I mean, he's been kind of integrated. This kind of showcases some of the, the power of some of these guns that are integrated into these uh, movies. You think these are the kind of games that are going to be able to kind of break through within, especially from a Web3 aspect? What are your thoughts, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, cosmetics, skins, weapons, I think these are at the core of, you know, fun in games. You look at CSGO, what's already happening in the Web 2 world where some of these cosmetics or items in game already are going for, in some cases, six figures. And I do think this is going to eventually um, just make sense, you know, in the NFT yeah. regard. So I definitely think this is going to be, you know, long term um, and maybe even short term when this game comes out will be a success, you know, and. I think some of these NFTs will be valuable, but I, I'm excited about it personally, uh, of course, uh, here on the channel. So, Yeah, for sure. Uh, here's their CEO. He's going into that they're going to actually expand beyond just some of the, the hardware here. Listen in. And uh, so users will be able to buy these uh, assets. So when we say assets, we mean guns. And we already saw that these people have, have, have uh, arms and legs that can be replaced obviously clothing and other items, et cetera. So these are, all, these are all things that go on the marketplace. Is that how this works? Exactly. So all of the assets which players can use in the game, including, for example, uh, hundreds of weapons animations, uh, uh, weapon animations and modifications, like scopes, barrels, uh, different skins, uh, inclu including um, body parts, uh, modified legs, Hands with unique abilities. All of this, um, all of these in-game items, they are tradable between players. This decentralized uh, trading, decentralized ownership, is taking place on a blockchain and specifically on an avalanche subnet. All right. Okay. So first of all, do you think that we're going to be uh, seeing, uh, you know, kind of this idea of third-party brands collaborating into, you know, you know, games like Godzilla? Is this something that's just still too early? Or do you think it's going to take a lot of fandom, you know, to, to try to hit the space for brands and other partners to come in? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that's something that brands are already exploring in the NFT space, as we're seeing across many different platforms. Um, and you look at Fortnite, there's already a bunch of IP and brands in that game. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time, you know, at least for especially the sentiment to improve among the gaming community. And again, with yeah. the games like like this and, and Dr. Disrespect Studio uh, pushing the needle forward, uh, again, I think it's just a matter of time before one brand just says, you know what, let's be one of the first pioneers here in the space. And then it's going to be a domino effect after that. So uh, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, speaking of that, Kyle, I've got a couple clips here. One is uh, the guns chain for use with small studios. Listen to what they had to say. We previously announced that a guns chain uh, will serve uh, all of the needs of uh, very small game developers which want to save time and effort on building, for example, their uh, NFT marketplace, their companion app wallets, which our uh, layer one, which is based on uh, Avalanche subnet will provide uh, for uh, game developers. But for big companies, I would highly recommend to work with Avalanche. Uh, <laughs> oh, I wasn't angry for that directly, one. Directly <laughs> but thank uh, you. Well, it's good. I mean, it's good that, you know, they're trying to build an infrastructure for it. But I think going direct, obviously, to go direct with Avalanche, you know, you've got to have a pretty big project. Speaking also of just the reaction of gamers, here is a clip that's showing some of what happened over at Gamescon. 
I mean, one look at who Gunzilla Games is following on Twitter, and you'll understand that this game has NFT written all over it. No fucking thanks. Also, a shout out to Diskin over on Twitter. He's a user who follows me. He sent me an image of this, which shows the Guns Wallet app, where you can manage all of your guns token NFTs that you can get in game. And over here, it looks like you can get uh, a sniper rifle, website, their logos, their style branding, all looks incredibly well done. And it's definitely easy to fool people when it looks this professional. This is Gamescom. This is main stage event larger than E3. This is millions of dollars invested into a video game that looks like something I'd find on Steam's early access for $15. This is the worst game trailer that we have seen, at least in like the double A slash triple A space, I, I want to say ever. All right, so a lot of hate coming in on it. Uh, and then you think about that along, do you, I mean, was this a good strategy to feel like where they were kind of hiding the fact that this is a Web3 play? Yeah, probably so. I mean, if they just came out right out the gates with it, um, you may get even worse backlash. Um, I think it's okay to kind of uh, use different terminology and appeal to gamers. I think that's totally fine. Um, and I think, again, I, I think people are just going to adopt this technology anyways. You know, anything with being new to a space, you're always going to get backlash initially. And then, of course, people are just going to adopt, you know, the, the technology. And I think there was even backlash around Battle Royale skins, cosmetics initially as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think they'll be fine. All right, Kai, so I want to jump over to Beam uh, and what it is. Let's listen in to this one right here. Last year, Merit Circle announced the upcoming launch of Sphere, which was supposed to be a state-of-the-art NFT marketplace that was centered on gaming. However, due to the bear market and a series of bad industry issues, the launch of Sphere was put on hold, waiting for the right moment to capture. The developers loved the Sphere concept, but they needed something to solve a solution for one major question of which blockchain would they even use. It was a gap that Merit Circle identified, and to fill it, they decided to create Beam and launch the subnet on Avalanche. And really it boils down to taking advantage of everything the Avalanche subnets have to offer with scalability and security, but also adds the empowerment of the Merit Circle DAO, which will bring an already robust community of enthusiasts, developers, and investors to ensure that there's both a confident and utility-filled launch with tons of games when it goes live. The first one being Trial Extreme, which is a racing game that has over 250 million downloads worldwide, and that's going to have its home on Beam. You've got Walker World, which is a massive open world experience that offers players and creators a chance to build on their own land. And then you've got games like Rainy The Lords of Light, which is a card battling game that recently announced that they're moving on to the Beam subnet. And they also just launched on the Epic Game Store, which I think is a huge step forward to have a game that's on the Epic Game Store that Web2 gamers are comfortable using and downloading and playing. All right, so with Beam, obviously within the Avalanche ecosystem, do you think this is kind of the, I guess, the IMX of AVAX? And, you know, outside the fact that you, you know, it's not the wall garden aspect where everything's locked in there. What are your thoughts about Beam? Yeah, I do like AVAX in terms of gaming. And of course, Beam being a subnet, essentially, um, I like that aspect because games or game developers don't have to kind of recreate the will every time they're going to launch a game or perhaps a studio or publisher one day. Um, you know, using a platform or a solution like AVAX. So um, I think this is a win. Again, uh, when you can handhold de game developers to launch, you know, blockchain on top of their game, then I think that's a big win in the space. So uh, definitely excited to see, you know, what, what Beam does, Merit Circle, and uh, some of their games that they'll hopefully onboard even more in the not-so-distant future. Yeah, a couple of the things they did mention was the Lords of Light right here on the Epic Game Store, so... Uh, good to see. That actually has a 4.9 rating, so that's interesting. And then also uh, Trial Extreme, this was the one too. Very, this actually has a lot of players on it already, even though it's not, you know, fantastic game, but the good thing is it's it's getting activity. So again, that's more more traction. I think the question will be is, you know, do we see a really big acceleration here right now? Because there's not a lot. We'll show you some charts here on what's happening on you know, on chain for Avalanche to give you some ideas. But I mean, you think like this is just the beginning of the wave for AVAX gaming? Yeah, I think so. And I think Shrapnel is a good example as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're going to be launching their game pretty soon. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a matter of time before, before we see even more games be onboarded. And to me, Avalanche is a good you know, solution because games, again, they don't have to re-adopt the wheel or recreate the wheel there. Right. And they can also 
have that customization that they need in their game with those subnets that Avalanche has. So um, I'm very excited about Avalanche and the potential of, of their games that they're going to hopefully onboard into the space. Kyle, here's a clip with the Godzilla team and the Avalanche team. Listen in. Is there anything specific about Avalanche um, and the subnet architecture that enabled Godzilla and Off the Grid to be pioneers in this space? We couldn't find any other solution on the market uh, where we could build what we originally planned to build. But we analyzed all of the all of the other solutions which other uh, companies on the market announced that they have it, and they can tell you that nothing worked. No, I mean, nothing worked. It doesn't mean that nothing worked for us. Nothing works still. Avalanche prides itself on on delivering things that actually work, and uh, and I'm great. Um, I'm just grateful to hear. Very good words. That Very good words because this is quite a unique thing to mm-hmm. deliver what you say, and Avalanche definitely does this. I think he's kind of speaking between the lines there about IMX. You know, not necessarily delivering on that. You know. Do you feel like that's more of a, a situation that's going to continue to drive developers onto these other chains off the IMX platform? Yeah, that's a good question. And again, I, to my point I just mentioned a minute ago is, is again, the, they don't have to recreate the wheel. And like as he was saying, it just works. And I think yeah. that's what Avalanche really excels at um, in terms of the two differences between IMX, you know, Avalanche. Um, and it's still early for IMX and and they may have some a ways to go before they you know, are out of the box, just ready to go for, for games. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how the space develops, you know. And uh, if, if we can get some good hit games in the space, I think that's a win for, for Web3 Gaming as a whole as well. Yeah. You had a story that you brought here, Kyle, that Immutable, Immutable was unveiling the tool to enforce the NFT royalties on Ethereum because that's one of the, you know, one of the things that they're not truly enforced right now. I mean, do you think this will work for IMX? What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is an interesting discussion, and I've actually had a discussion with uh, Gabe Layden from uh, Limit Break, who's developed his own, you know, royalty uh, smart contract, I believe it is. And, you know, he was even kind of skeptical and was saying that, you know, as games develop, they may introduce his contract or may end up using his um, standard as like the go-to for the the wider industry. So yeah. I, I don't know if this is like 100% solving the royalty issue on IMX, but it is interesting. At least they're trying, and um, I do, you know, uh, support what they're trying to do there. But again, I don't know if it's the 100%, you know, uh, solution for everybody out there. You may need to have a couple different layers, and uh, like Gabe Layden pointed out. Yeah, for sure. Uh, just so everybody's aware, this is not, uh, you know, I am, or excuse me, uh, Godzilla and, you know, Avalanche. This is not like a, a paid, this is us just doing an analysis of it. So no sponsor here at all on this. I want to go over and play a little bit of uh, footage here from the Shrapnel. We've had the Shrapnel team on. When you look at this game and versus where it was, say, about a year ago, I don't know if you've been following it that long, uh, but... What are your thoughts on this? I mean, it feels like they've really made a lot of advancements. Yeah, I've tested this game at the Consensus event in Austin, and the graphics are really great. I mean, um, they've done a really good job in, in probably a short amount of time. I think the team has is, is got experience there in that field as well. It definitely feels like a AAA. They need to work out some of the physics the last time I played. Um, but other than that, I think they just clean up a few things there, and this could be one of those uh, solid hits in Web3 gaming for sure. What about this one versus Godzilla? What do you think? Well, gamers like to play multiple titles often. You know, you'll see people switch from Call of Duty to Fortnite to, you know, in some cases, hey, I I still play Halo, but uh, it's not as popular as it once was. But you typically see gamers swap out titles for other titles and and kind of rotate back and forth. So I don't think there's going to be too much, you know, competitive nature there. I think it's just a win for... uh, yeah, the genre as a lift of space as, you know, in terms of FPS games in general in the Web3 space. All right. So I wanted to jump into some of the data and analytics side of this in just terms of the, you know, some of the transactions when you look at users, transactions, etc. Jumping over to Dune Analytics, of course, uh, right here, just kind of showing daily active users here on IMX seems to be declining a little bit. Not a lot of activity over there. And of course, you can see weekly weekly active users on IMX again. Um, Then you look at just the idea here of what's happening over here on a a Mutascan. 
not a lot of, of these games really getting a lot of trans, uh, you know, transactions outside of Gods Unchained. It's pretty much Gods Unchained and then everything else. Do you think that's just this bear market? It's the fact we haven't seen a lot of games really, really releasing uh, yet? Or, or do you think that it's IMX just not necessarily getting the right kind of games for players to play? Yeah, it could be a mixture of a few things. Like you mentioned, there's the bear market, the games might not fully be launched, and the possibility, you know, in terms of what I see as a gamer, I I would like to see the ability to bridge some NFTs to other, you know, like Layer 1, for example, and have a couple of those options. I think we've seen, you know, even on IMX, there's some closed ecosystems and closed apps, and it's kind of hard to navigate. And it'd be nice, you know, to have that out of the box where you can bridge, you know, maybe your more expensive NFTs outside of IMX and have that stored in self-custody in your own ledger device. But it's kind of hard to do all that um, on IMX currently. So I feel like they can definitely improve yeah. in terms of, you know, their their UI and, and their kind of like tech stack and what they're kind of offering there. But again, they, they did integrate recently the Polygon ZK EVM. So, um, but again, we it, it seems like they just did the test net. We'll see where uh, they go with that. Yeah, here's featured marketplaces right now. Token Trove, GameStop, Aqua. I mean, not not ones that we've heard of here, but definitely not into the major, you know, marketplaces that are out there. Uh, just a handful. Which again could be the other aspect that is kind of holding back a lot of these, you know, transactions. Versus when you take a look at, say, you know, uh, an example of just what's happening over on the subnets right here with uh, with Avalanche. Again, growth is starting to really uh, take off here, and this is interesting because there hasn't really been a major, you know, any major launches, and there hasn't been a lot of of games rolling out on this. So. I mean, the fact that they're growing tells me that means a lot of people are testing it and working on it. So that's going to be, I think, good for Avalanche overall, uh, for sure. What do you think when you look at those kind of numbers, Kyle, and you see uh, an ecosystem that's been around for a while versus, I mean, really subnets on Avalanche, really only about six, eight months old since they started really uh, moving forward with a lot of the new development aspects. Obviously, you see the shrapnel subnet in here, I think, right here. Um, but do you think that this is a good thing for, uh, for a chain when you start to see all this activity starting to brew up around either developers or new games, or is it prepping for maybe a, a bull market with activity? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think kind of all the above. Like when you have this activity, it's going to attract more developers, more, you know, games, obviously, and build general excitement around the community, um, you know, AVAX gaming and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely think that this is kind of the beginning of what we're seeing on AVAX, and I think they're going to continue to onboard more games there and pick up more activity. Again, the subnets I think is really great uh, in terms of you know what it offers games. Uh, you know, there's pros and cons. I mean, there's still going to be minor transaction fees from what I understand, but um, it's not like it's that going to be that expensive. And it again, um, this is good for for games, and I think that they offer a pretty good solution for, in the subnets. Yeah. Yeah. Other news, uh, Swift, of course, details findings in some tests they recently did with, with Chainlink, which was very successful. So if you're a big Chainlink fan, you guys should be uh, really kind of focused in on what's happening with Chainlink. We are one for sure. But one thing that interested me was this statement right here. Experiments were conducted on the public test nets on Ethereum Sepolia and then also on Avalanche. So another reason that you could look at the AVAX ecosystem is going to get support from a lot of different variations. You look at some additional data here from Dune, Optimism, Transactions, Polygon Transactions, kind of flatlining right here. Optimism, all this, of course, is base. Uh, Arbitrum, which is pretty much the one that has been taken out, obviously, because of, of Optimism. And then you've got Avalanche Transactions starting to, to move up, even though they've flatlined a little bit here, but, but definitely up since, say, March uh, right here, which was around 97,000 total transactions. All right, so this is just showing kind of the USDC transactions. Polygon kind of winning the game right here, but you've got, uh, of course, Optimism and also Arbitrum, which was the bridge side, and then Avalanche right there. Um, So again, another good sign for the potential for all of this. So, all right, so also showing in a little bit more around the token unlocks, currently 21% on the inflation side of this, along with some unlocks that are occurring with AVAX. So that's just to be aware of that. 
and take a look at the total fees burned on, on AVAX. So uh, there is a lot of transparency where some of the projects out there don't necessarily have that. So that's a, another good sign for Avalanche as a whole from the gaming side X as well. Okay, and another way you could offset a little bit of the inflation is obviously through a staking strategy. And if you just kind of show this, you can go in and kind of do your own calculation there. We'll just put in 10,000 on AVAX. So you can kind of see the earnings a little bit there in terms of overall. We'll take a look at a handful of tokens as well. And uh, let me take a look over here at TradingView real quick. Bitcoin, by the way, right now starting to see a price correction a little bit. If you look where Avalanche is going, of course, it has corrected. We're, we'll steer her on the four hour. Maybe this is an interesting time, but if you look at it over time, the question for Avalanche is when would be a good time to take a look at this one. Others that are out there on the ecosystem is Joe. Let's jump over to Joe and take a look at uh, Joe also spiking uh, as well. So we're seeing a little bit of activity right here with Joe. And then uh, beyond that, you've also got Dexalot, which is the Allot token uh, a little bit there, also showing uh, some interesting aspects around the Avalanche ecosystem playing into this. So whether you're following tokens, you're following the game ecosystem on Avalanche, or you're just looking at the strategy that AVAX and Avalanche has taken over you know, the last year, a lot is happening uh, in this ecosystem. Kyle, when you look at all the gaming platforms. You think, um, you look at Matic, you look at Solana, you maybe take a look at what's happening here within the AVAX ecosystem. And in general, is there any one area that you're more impressed with than others? What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I am, uh, you know, impressed with subnets and again, what the what they offer games specifically. Again, you know, you can build your game around that subnet. So I think that's exciting. Um, Polygon and, and the other ZKs will have a little bit more ways to go in terms of their development and what they can really, you know, provide games and, and their development and how the NFTs are used in the game as well. So um, the thing I like about Beam is it seems like they're going to seamlessly integrate games into uh, Beam as well as their marketplace as well. So it's like this seamless experience mm -hmm. uh, versus other platforms where you may have to... Um, you know, bridge or, you know, it's kind of stuck in there. So uh, definitely give and takes. And it's going to be an interesting race to see who can really, uh, you know, win the game developer race there. So if you're if you're a betting person and you're saying, hey, listen, I'm, I'm thinking about going in on uh, a platform and I'm going to I'm going to, you know, hedge my bet on which one might work in this next bull run, because there's going to be a lot of new games starting to hit. Is there any one that you would say, hey, this is the route I would take? Yeah, I think Matic and AVAX are probably at the, the top of my list there, my short list. Um, those are the two that I really think will do really well in the bull run in terms of gaming. Um, and we know that Matic is, is no stranger to onboarding a lot of the brands in general. And AVAX, I think, is is going to have a lot of success there too, especially in Web3 gaming. So, Yeah, Beam Token right here, up about 60% just since August 1st. So. It did have a little bit of a peak right there, which was almost 38 cents. So interesting stuff. I think this is one to definitely watch. Obviously, we cover Avalanche on the on the space quite a bit. We do get their team on. We've had Avalanche Gaming on before. We've had their, you know, their infrastructure team on with Ava Labs as well. So we probably should get them back. With all of this news coming in, maybe there are some other opportunities kind of in the wings. So we're going to keep a close eye on it. If you guys are not tuned in, make sure and jump into our Diamond Circle. And it, by the way, if you guys don't know, Kyle hosts a podcast over on the Diamond Circle uh, every week, and he breaks down a lot of the Web3 news. It's been going great. Uh, viewership and audio uh, listens are up a lot, so continue to subscribe to the Diamond Circle. We'll leave a link down below. You can catch Kyle's podcast over there, additional analysis, all that good stuff. And of course, you can always catch Kyle out there at Tiger Wilson on uh, Twitter or X uh, as well. Hey, Kyle, thanks for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, excellent. All right, so you guys, listen, we're going to be doing coverage uh, throughout the week. We've got a lot happening within the ETF side. We've got some additional interviews coming out, so make sure and stick around for those. If you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure and subscribe right now because it's going to be one of the ways that will help spread the news. If you're a Web3 gaming or maybe you're just a Web3 uh, you know, aficionado, this is the show to follow. It's where you're going to get a lot of this alpha. So make sure and hit that 
uh, little bell. It's going to give you notifications when we do live streams, all that good stuff. And of course, if you guys want to catch me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath. Thank <laughs> you.